Hi, I'm Jenna. I'm the Director of Foster Programs here at the Humane Rescue Alliance. Sarah Dottie, our Foster Program Manager, will be teaching you about the care of unweaned kittens and puppies, including grooming, feeding, developmental milestones, recognizing symptoms of illness, and she'll even demonstrate how to feed an unweaned kitten. Thank you for your interest and willingness in fostering this population of animals. Stay tuned after Sarah's presentation for information on how to receive credit for completion of this training. Thank you for your patience and thank you so much for joining us today. We're really grateful that you're interested in helping us care for these little ones. Um, they are really our most delicate population and um, it's not possible to care for these little ones inside the shelter environment since they require round the clock care. So your participation in the foster program and your willingness to foster these little babies, it is literally life-saving and we're just so very grateful for everything that you do. Um, uh, as Jenna said, I'm the, the manager of the foster program here at HRA and the squeaking that you hear in the background occasionally, that is my little foster baby, Abby Kadabi, who you'll be seeing up close and in person in the demonstration section at the end. Um, but for right now, you may just hear her complaining a little bit because it's been a whole hour and she hasn't had her latest bottle. Um, one of the things that we'll be talking more about soon is the frequency that you feed babies and we'll get into that, but she's a little spoiled, so you might hear a little extra from her. So here we go. Wonderful. So um, thanks again for being here. And the goal, obviously, of uh, helping out these little guys is to get them big enough and healthy enough to be put up for adoption. So in the pre-pandemic world, um, being ready for adoption meant hitting that magical two pound mark, which was big enough to be uh, spayed and neutered and kittens would have to be spayed and neutered before they had been gone, before they were cleared to go up for adoption. Um, in the current world, in, in the pandemic world, <clears throat> excuse me, um, HRA like other organizations had to suspend our spay neuter services. So we had to change that a little bit. The good news is is that our spay neuter is coming back online, which is really fantastic and crucial. But um, we aren't fully there yet. And in the meantime, um, the milestones for being ready for, for adoption are a little bit different. So in, in the current world, kittens have to be at least six weeks old before they're ready to go up for adoption. And then um, we do follow up with all of the adopters and we're gonna be making sure that all of these little ones are spayed and neutered even after they've been adopted. So that is really important and is something that we will make sure happens. So for getting them there, what it takes, primarily the, the main thing you're worried about really is appropriate feeding and care that will definitely be keeping you pretty busy. Um, there's lots of also, also lots of routine, not a lot, just a, a decent amount of routine medical care that you'll need to um, provide and schedule for the kittens, just like you would with any other infant growing up, making sure they get their vaccines and, um, and get seen um, by medical staff whenever they aren't feeling well. So that last part, um, when they're not feeling well, definitely recognizing signs of illness is important and we'll go over uh, what some of those are, what's really critical, what are the type of things that you just need to keep an eye on um, and make sure that, that they don't get to that critical point and schedule uh, medical care when appropriate. So how HRA can help? We are super lucky in that we have a a fabulous group of volunteers called case managers. And if you've fostered other animals for HRA, you've interacted with our case managers um, in the past. They are your primary resource while you're fostering um, kittens and other animals for HRA. They check in with you regularly. They make sure that you know how to make a medical appointment and they'll provide reminders for whenever any medical services are needed. So just like um, baby humans, kitten needs back, kittens and puppies need vaccines every few weeks and they will make sure that you remain on schedule with that. We also have an online appointment system and um, that includes, um, we've actually expanded a little bit the way that we use technology for medical appointments. And um, while we have in-person appointments for vaccines, of course, we also have telemedicine appointments that you can utilize for when kittens aren't feeling well. So that is a really wonderful resource to have as well. And then finally, of course, um, we have supplies that we can provide you. When you signed up on deck and you said you were interested in fostering kittens, it will ask you which supplies that you need. And um, we will make sure to get you those critical supplies when you pick up your kitten. And we'll talk more a little bit later about what those supplies are. And then, of course, we do have a website where we have um, all of that information. We also have some videos about how to bottle feed babies and all kinds of other good stuff that's a really good resource to have for whenever you have those types of questions.
So for kittens, um, monitoring them and making sure that they are um, that they are uh, continually gaining weight and aren't showing any signs of illness, those are all really, really important. And it's important to keep track of where your kitten is and make sure that they are healthy and growing. And by far the most critical thing is weighing the kittens regularly. And um, that should be for Un any underage kittens, it should be at least once a day. If you have brand new neonatal babies that are just a week old or so, weighing them twice a day is a good idea. Or um, also if you, if the kittens are experiencing, experiencing any symptoms of illness or being treated for illness, you might also want to weigh more than once a day, again, just to make sure that they are not um, losing weight and um, getting to any critical stage. Weight loss is really the most important indicator of both of um, progression that a kitten is growing at a healthy rate. And also it's often going to be your first sign that something is wrong and that you need to keep an eye out for other symptoms that you might expect to see. Or um, even if you don't see any other symptoms, if a kitten is losing weight regularly, it would still be something that would need to be seen by a vet because there might be something else wrong there. When kittens get sick, um, they can go downhill very, very quickly. So it's really important to keep a close eye on them and get the appropriate care whenever or something looks like it might be going wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so kittens gain approximately half an ounce a day. Um, the, every kitten is unique and they have different growth spurts and things like that. So um, that's kind of how it averages out. So don't worry if your kitten isn't gaining half an ounce every single day. Sometimes they'll have days where they gain maybe a tenth of an ounce for three or four days in a row. And then the next day they gain, um, you know, seven tenths of an ounce. So they kind of go in the spurts all the time. So it's it's really kind of the steady, steady upward progression that you really want to see um, and keeping track of that is really important. So when kittens are born, they're only about two to four ounces. They are little teeny tiny things. And, um, and again, they're gaining about half an ounce a day during that first week and a half of life. Once they hit 10 to 14 days, ideally they should be around half an ounce. Um, two to three weeks, they are um, about three quarters of a pound. At four weeks, they should be hitting a pound. Um, and then ideally by eight weeks, they hit two pounds. Um, this is kind of ideal circumstances. The reality is kittens that are orphaned that come into the shelter don't often have this steady growth pattern. So don't worry if they're not hitting these exact milestones. Again, it's all about the upward progression of weight. That's really important. Um, temperature kittens are not able to regulate their own body heat and um, so it's really important to keep them in an environment where they have a heat source where they aren't subject to draft and things like that um, their normal temperature is between 100 and 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit and that's not something you need to monitor we really only take their temperatures if we're if they're showing some other signs of illness and we have any other concerns but just so you know um, it is important that they make sure to stay nice and warm so my, I've been a kitten foster for 12 years now, and so my instinctive language is all about puppies, uh, sorry, all about kittens, but um, pretty much everything we're talking about today applies to puppies as well. And we do sometimes get bottle baby puppies at, into HRA, and we do need foster parents for them. For puppies really, oh boy, sorry, um, I'm not sure if you heard that glorious sound that came out of little Abby Cadabby, but she just learned how to poop on her own today and she's demonstrating that. So um, my apologies if that sound hit your ears. I'm glad this does not have smell of vision Anyway, sorry about the distraction. Okay, so the main difference with puppies is that obviously because they are different breeds, they're going to gain weight at, at um, or um, the, the net amount of weight that they gain is gonna be very different. A, a Chihuahua is obviously gonna gain smaller amounts of weight at a time than a Great Dane will. So in general, they're gonna be increasing their weight about five to 10% daily. And again, just like kittens, um, puppies are all unique and they may be, um, they may have growth spurts, they may have plateaus, that's okay. We're still looking for that upward progression of weight gain. And again, um, keeping track of that, like in a little spreadsheet or paper or things like that, that's all gonna be really important to um, making sure that um, a kitten stays, puppy stays healthy and that if anything is starting to go sideways, that you are able to get that care right away um, before they get um, really ill. Puppies are a little bit cooler, they have the core temperature. When they're born, they are 96 to 97 degrees, and then um, they're going to get up to um, up to about 100 degrees when, once they hit a week old. Again, that's just for your info, not something that you um, need to be keeping track of. 
So um, as Abby was so ably demonstrating for us a few moments ago, um, a poop is really important in the monitoring of kittens and of puppies. And um, and that's because when kittens are, um, are sick, um, obviously uh, if they have any sort of intestinal things going on their their little gi tracts are still developing their immune systems are still developing and they are therefore more prone to things like worms different intestinal infections and things like that and um, in addition to weight um, the second indicator of illness that is really common in kittens and puppies is going to be when their poop starts looking not quite like expected so whenever you report a problem to your case manager with your with your little ones um, with your little ones poop one of the questions that they're going to be asking you is what their fecal score is and that is that picture that you see right there um, that's the Purina fecal scoring system going from um, at the top left there that is an animal that is probably constipated you, you won't see that too often you will see it occasionally in kittens and puppies but we deal more with the other end of the spectrum these scores of six and seven and those are um, those are the the full-on diarrhea where some sort of treatment or supportive care is going to be required so um, that's really important to know um, we do recommend, and we hope this is the only time anyone asks you to do this, that you do take a picture of your kitten or puppy's diarrhea if they do, when they do have it. Um, you can send that to your case manager so they can sort of help you figure out what supportive care is needed. And you can also upload it into the online page where you make appoint medical appointments so our medical team can see it as well, and that will help them understand the severity of the diarrhea. Um, brown is a normal color, not surprisingly, although in bottle baby kittens, actually, um, their, their stool, it can be a little more yellowish when they're still on the formula, so that's not uncommon to see. Um, bloody stool does indicate that there is a problem. Um, sometimes it can be just an irritation if they've had diarrhea, maybe the skin around there is irritated, but it can indicate, indicate a parasitic infection <clears throat> or the panleukopenia virus, which is a virus that affects uh, cats and kittens. Um, when kittens have excessive diarrhea or they're straining a lot, you might see some mucus in there. Um, black stool is scary because it means that there is possibly bleeding higher in the GI tract, and that could be a very serious medical condition. So definitely let your case manager know if you ever saw something that you thought might be black stool. Um, yellow to white, um, that, that can also indicate an a bacterial imbalance um, and it might be an infection with something like coccidia. Um, not always though but the the so I wouldn't worry too too much about the color really the the um, consistency is the most important thing although the color can be really helpful as well and you can refer back to this as a reference if you ever need it in the future. So developmental milestones for kittens. Um, kittens and puppies, as we'll go over, they're born with their eyes and their ears completely closed. So they're deaf and blind when they're born. The only, sem the only um, senses that they have are smell and touch. They use smell to get to mama's teats to nurse for the first time. They also use touch to get to her teats. That's one of the reasons why mama cats purr when they're nursing. Um, kittens, when they're climbing up on her, they feel that purr with their paw pads and that lets them know that they're in the right place. So purrs actually form or are, um, are a very important tool for our mama cats to use. About two to three days old, their umbilical cord is going to fall off. If you have a newborn kitten that still has the umbilical cord, it's really important not to pull it off. Um, if it comes off too early, they can get an infection in there and that can cause them to get very sick. So it's important to just let that cord fall off on its own. Um, sometimes they'll start purring as young as four days old, sometimes they don't. Once they hit the second week of life, their eyes and their ears are going to open and um, the ears you don't really notice quite as much, um, but the eyes it's kind of fun to see, especially if you have a litter of kittens, um, the eyeball race, whose, whose eyeballs start popping open first. Um, they first start getting their first teeth in the, in, at, at about week two. Um, their little incisors, which are the tiny little teeth in the very front, start erupting, and those are the first ones you'll see. Um, once they hit about three weeks, they can start going to the bathroom on their own. That's one thing that you'll need to do for them that we'll, we'll talk more about later. Um, in the in wild, mama cat actually takes care of stimulating them to go to the bathroom, um, but that's where we have to help them out when they're orphans that we're caring for in the program. 
Also at two to three weeks, they start crawling and they have kind of the shaky walking. <clears throat> Lots of fun to watch them at this stage because they are, they're very goofy looking little things. At four weeks, their canine teeth start coming out. Those are the, the what look like the fangs. Um, they're walking better, their little tail straight up in the air, but they're still a little bit on the wobbly side and still pretty funny to watch. Then once they hit six weeks, their premolars, which are the teeth kind of in the middle and the back, start coming out. At this age, they're going to be running around more. They're going to be playing more. They should be using the litter box um, really um, consistently on their own. Um, <clears throat> In, they should ideally uh, start eating kitten food, dry kitten food around six weeks. Some of them started earlier, some of them just like the wet food, that's okay. Um, we'll talk a lot more about weaning in a future slide. And then by eight weeks, they should be ready for adoption. And as I mentioned earlier, in this pandemic world, they can be adopted before they are spayed and neutered. In the ideal world, in the, the previous world, they are gonna be spayed or neutered before they go home. But even if they uh, get adopted, in these current times before spay neuter, they our adoption or our medical team will be following up with the adopters to make sure they do get um, they do get snipped uh, after they've been adopted. Milestones for puppies are quite similar. Um, they they are also born blind and deaf. Their eyes and ears start opening right around that second week as well. Um, their their teeth development start start in the same way. They start with the um, actually they start sorry with the canine teeth, the little fangs, and then go to the incisors. They start barking around two or three weeks old, and I admire all of you people who want to foster puppies because. Um, they are a little bit louder than kittens, even though Abby here has made, made her voice known. She is definitely ready for her, her next bottle. Um, but yeah, with puppies, you start hearing the barking and the whining, all that fun stuff. At four weeks, they can start on um, start the weaning process. And by six weeks, they are running and playing and can start on um, solid food. For puppies, um, the, the weight for surgery doesn't matter as much because obviously a Great Dane is going to hit two pounds a long way before a Chihuahua puppy would. So in general, puppies um, are ready for adoption at about seven weeks of age. <clears throat> so routine medical care for kittens is really, really, really important. Um, the site that you see or the URL that you see there is where you'll make your appointments for vaccines and dewormers. And um, it is, like I said, important that you do keep up with that and that your case manager will be sending you reminders and making sure that you have all the info that you need to make those appointments. So there's a couple things happening at those appointments. One important thing is deworming, <clears throat> and that takes care of any... Um, any intestinal parasites that they may have ingested. If they or mom had fleas, then it's possible that they have worms, which is not fun. Um, when kittens have um, when kittens have worms, that can cause lots and lots of diarrhea, and diarrhea can be really debilitating in kittens and in puppies. So um, that dewormer is really important. They're going to get it um, starting at two weeks, and then getting it every at two weeks of age, and getting every two weeks thereafter. Once they hit four weeks of age, they're going to get their first vaccines. They'll be getting the FERC vaccine just one time, and then the FERCP vaccine, which is just slightly different with that P on the end, they'll be getting that every two weeks. So, um, and this is also in the, the, the pre-pandemic world, this was how the schedule worked. In the pandemic world, um, the way things are right now, rather than getting vaccines every two weeks, they will go every three to four weeks. So it'll be a little bit different. And um, this is also where case managers are gonna be really important because they'll be letting you know whenever any procedures changes, uh, any procedures change regarding medical or adoption or anything like that anything else like that regarding kittens. But um, in the ideal world, they should be getting their vaccines every two weeks and their dewormer as well. And, um, but they can get it up to up to four weeks apart um, if they absolutely have to, like we do in these crazy times we're living in today. Um, routine medical care for puppies is really similar. They're gonna be getting vaccines and dewormers every two weeks. Um, the, uh, there is one other vaccine that they only get once, that's Bordetella, and that is the vaccine for kennel cough. And, um, and then DAPPV, which is distemper and a few other things, um, they're gonna be getting that every two weeks, or again, in this pandemic world, it'll be every three to four weeks. Um, they'll be getting those boosters regularly. So housing is gonna be really important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, kittens and then also puppies, they're not able to regulate their body temperature when they're born. So keeping them warm is really, really important. Um, we have um, a tool we can send you home with called a Snuggle Safe, which is a, just a 
plastic disc that you pop in the microwave for about four minutes and it keeps them, um, it, it stays warm for up to eight hours, which is a really wonderful thing, especially when you have a singleton like this puppy here who doesn't have litter mates to also help keep him warm. It is definitely important that in their enclosure, they be able to move away from that heat source because they can get overheated. Um, so they do need to have enough space that they can either be on the heat source, the snuggle safe. The um, There are some companies, Revival Animal Health sells some good ones that make um, plug-in heating pads that are really good for animals, for puppies, kittens, and things like that, that are that don't turn off so they don't have an auto off um, timer and they also have two proof cords which is nice too. Of course they're not as flexible because you can't move them around like you can snuggle safes but that's another really nice heat source to use um, if you have access to it. The enclosure itself needs to be, crates and carriers are really good. I literally keep my bottle baby kittens in a carrier for at least the first two weeks of life because they really don't need any more space than that. They just need the snuggle safe area and then the area away from it. Um, it's really portable. You can take them with you wherever you go. I've literally taken bottle babies with me to Costco, to grocery stores, even to a doctor's appointment once and the doctor never realized I had kittens there with me because they were there in their little slim carrier. Um, make sure whatever carrier you use, it doesn't have any, any areas where their legs and arms can get stuck. So uh, wire dog crates are good in a lot of ways, but if you're using them for little kittens, especially in the first one to two weeks of life, you might want to make like a bumper around the bottom using some towels or um, blankets so that they can't get their little arms and legs stuck in in those areas between the wires. Um, you also want to make sure it's quiet and low stress and um, for bedding make sure that there's nothing that they can chew on or get stuck in so frayed edges, strings, and tassels are not good. Also for kittens um, especially in their first three weeks uh, they actually cannot retract their claws. Their claws are just kind of stuck out. So one other thing to avoid for kittens is terry cloth towels because that terry cloth has little loops that their little tiny claws can get stuck in and it can cause them to injure their legs or paws if they get stuck in there. Feeding bottle babies. Um, so this is, of course, the fun part. And um, the instruments that you need are definitely really important. Um, of course, you need a bottle, and that's something we can send you home with. We definitely have plenty of those. Most bottle kits that you buy at the pet store, and it's nice you can get them at Petco and PetSmart and such, they have... Um, a nipple that you actually have to cut the or either uh, get a hole in the top of it whether cutting with scissors or using a hot needle there's different ways to get that hole in there um, but it can be a little bit tricky to get the hole the right size too big and they get too much formula in their mouth too small and they can't get enough formula so what we strongly recommend is the use of the miracle nipple um, and that's what you see right there we will um, we do have plenty of those and we will send you home with a miracle nipple and it truly, truly lives up to its name. You don't have to cut a hole. It's just the right size and shape and kittens get the hang of using miracle nip bottles with miracle nipples, <clears throat> excuse me, much more quickly than they seem to with the, the old fashioned style of nipples. So they are, they are absolutely wonderful. Formula is really important as well. So um, the two types of formulas for kittens and for puppies, kitten milk replacer, puppy milk replacer, KMR and PMR, they're formulated with all of the nutrition, all of the, um, uh, ev everything the kitten needs to grow nice and strong and make sure that it is um, it is safe and easy on their digestive systems. If you feed a kitten or a puppy cow's milk or even goat's milk, um, it ha sometimes has too much sugar or lactose, um, different elements that can cause digestive distress, and it doesn't necessarily have all the nutrients that they need. So it's really important that you give them formula <clears throat> that is created for their specific species. Most brands you do need to refrigerate after opening, so take a, a good look at the instructions on the can and um, make sure you follow those instructions because you don't want it to go bad. It can get sour and clumped and really gross. Um, and then of course it becomes unsafe and upsetting for the kitten's stomach when it gets clotted and things like that. Um, temperature, you about 100 degrees. You don't need to be exact in, in the temperature of the formula, but it needs to be warm enough that it is, you know, similar to their own, their own body temperature for them to eat. If you feed a kitten cold formula, it's just like when you're, you know, if you're 
standing outside in the cold weather and you um, eat a, a Slurpee, um, it's going to chill you from the inside. So basically with kittens, it's that kind of thing on steroids. Since they can't regulate their own body temperature, putting a cold liquid inside their body can be dangerous for them. So it's important to make sure that that, that milk is nice and warm. What I normally do is um, I make up a bottle that I'll have ready for at least half of the day. And whenever I go to feed the kittens, I will put a um, fill a coffee mug um, half fill half half full of just tap water, pop it in the microwave for one minute and then drop the bottle into that um, water in the cup. It usually only takes a minute or two for the formula to be warm enough. It heats it nice and even, and um, it doesn't get too hot too quickly, which is really nice. So that's a, a nice way to reheat formula that you haven't used yet. Um, as far as the quantity that the puppy or kitten should eat, that will be on the canister as well. Um, and that is, it, it's broken out into total amount per day and um, total number of feedings per day. Um, it's not as important to worry about the exact amount that they're eating as it is, again, to make sure that they're gaining weight. So if they're not eating exactly what the recommendation is on the can, but they're still having a nice steady weight gain, that's not a, not a cause for concern. Um, just like with humans, metabolisms are different in kittens, and so sometimes um, the, the amounts that they'll eat are a little bit different. So um, again, keeping up with that weight gain is really the important thing. So frequency, um, this is the um, probably the hardest part I think for most people about fostering bottle babies is how often they need to be fed. The good news is um, it's really only a couple weeks where they are eating very, very frequently, where they're, they're literally eating into your sleep schedule. But once you hit week three, um, they can go a whole six hours without a bottle and you're getting in almost a whole night's sleep. So the first couple nights, yes, they might, or a couple weeks might be a little bit rough, but then it's over really fast and you have a really cute kitten that is an adorable age and you have gotten them through the most delicate and fragile period of their lives, um, which is just really, really important and a, a wonderful gift to them. So when they're a week old, um, first week to two, they're going to be eating six to ten um, times a day and they're gonna be eating every two to four hours. So as you hit that second week and get into the end of that second week, you can stretch it farther and farther towards those four hours. Um, what I tend to do is let my kittens eat as often as they wake up and want to during the day. Um, if they are, they don't wake up after a total of four hours, then I will still wake them up and have them eat. Um, and then during the night, um, obviously don't wanna, I'll go the whole four hours before waking up to give them their food. So that way they're kind of, they're getting their tummy nice and full during the day and then getting them enough to get them through the night and also not leave you completely sleep deprived. Once they hit three weeks old, um, this is kind of the, the golden period. They're down to four to eight feedings a day and they can go up to six hours <clears throat> um, between meal. Once they hit four weeks old, they're gonna be close to weaning and they can go the whole eight hours, no problem. And they, so they're eating normally about every five to eight hours. <clears throat> um, with Abby here, who you can hear still squeaking, during the day, she probably still tends to eat every two to three hours, which is fine, but she can go the whole night and she'll be okay all of those eight hours, which is great for me. So when you're, eat, when you're feeding them, um, this is a really important thing. You want to be feeding them so that their stomach is facing the ground. Um, the instinct might be to feed them the way you would a human baby. Um, you know how when you cradle a human baby in your arms, um, their stomach is facing the ceiling. Um, that will not work for kittens and puppies. That's actually really dangerous. You need to make sure that their belly is touching the ground or you know your lap or wherever you're feeding them. Um, the reason why that's important is because of the way their their little bodies are put together. If you feed them while they're on their backs, it can cause the formula to go into their lungs, which is called aspiration, and that can be really dangerous because it can cause pneumonia, which can be fatal. So it's really, really important that you do make sure that they're on their tummies, just like you see with this puppy here, and you'll see with Abby in a little bit whenever you're feeding them. That bottle is ideally at 45 degrees. That, that mimics what... Um, the the situation when they're nursing on their mom in in the in the wild or the the real world um you don't want to squeeze milk into the puppy or kitten's mouth again because you could squeeze too much and that could go straight into their lungs rather than having them swallow it um so that is really important as well refusal to nurse so this is actually pretty common and um 
if it happens the first time you bring home your little ones, it's not anything you're doing. Don't worry about it. Um, they're frustrated and stressed out because they're away from mom and you're sticking this plastic thing with this weird tasting liquid in their mouth and they will often get frustrated and, and take a while to um, really get the hang of it and enjoy the bottle. They will come around pretty quickly and they will absolutely love their bottles. Um, kittens, even when they have been weaned, when they see that bottle, it's so funny because they just make a beeline for it. Even when they're happy to be eaten, they're, they're, they're big kitty food, they still love the bottle and we'll go back to it if you give them a chance. So um, so just be patient when they, if, if they're fussing and fighting with you at the very beginning, I'll show you some tips for how I deal with that with kittens. Um, but yeah, just be patient because it will take them some time to figure it out. If they're not eating, a couple things you can double, you can check on to make sure or to help them along. Make sure the formula is warm enough. Um, make sure that the kitten or the puppy is warm enough. That is really important because if you feed a kitten when it's cold, it can essentially cause some of their organs to shut down and it can um, lead to them crashing and possibly dying. So make sure that they're nice and warm before you attempt to feed them. Um, positioning is important. Sometimes you want to give them something for them to make biscuits on, to knead on like they would with their mom while they're nursing. There's a really great tool we have called a snuggle kitty, and we can send you home with one of those. That's basically a, a little stuffed animal kitty that kind of mimics the shape of mom. And it comes with a little, little device that makes a heartbeat sound. And you can also put a, um, a heat source into it, either a um, a little um, heating pack, which is similar to like a the hand warmer that would that you would use to stick in your pockets during the winter, where you open it once, stick it in your pocket, and it keeps your hand warm. Well, that goes in this little snuggle kitty, and so it really simulates the feel of mom and can really comfort kittens that are um, that are stressed out or or struggling. Another thing you can do is put a dab of caro syrup on the bottle nipple. Um, what that does is that gets some sugar right into their bloodstream because it's going to be hitting their, um, their gums. And just like when you're hungry and you have really low blood sugar, your energy is really down. Um, with kittens, it can get to the point where they don't want to eat even though they're really hungry. So getting that little bit of caro syrup into them can really help as well. Um, also rubbing the kitten or puppy, their forehead or their back. Um, that simulates mama, dog, or cat grooming them, and that can also encourage them. Um, toothbrushes are really nice to use with kittens because that stimulates um, mama cat's, the, the bristles on her tongue. So those are, um, those are really handy as well. When you have multiple kittens and puppies, um, the easiest way to make sure they're, they're getting enough is to basically just kind of do a round robin. Most kittens will not eat for more than 30 seconds to a minute at a time. Sometimes they'll eat a little bit more than that, but um, then they like to take a break. Um, sometimes they need to be burped, just like humans do. Sometimes they belch on their own. Um, but using, uh, once they've kind of pulled off the nipple, then you switch over to the next litter mate and give them a few minutes. And then you kind of repeat that a few times. That makes sure that everyone gets satisfied. And it's really the the most efficient and um, best way to, to get everyone fed. So as I mentioned earlier, puppies and kittens can't go to the bathroom on their own. In the in the wild, their mom would be stimulating them by um, by licking their genitals and actually eating what they eliminate, which fortunately we don't have to do that part. But the reason why they do that is kittens and puppies, of course, are, if it was in the wild, they would be very vulnerable to predators. And um, that elimination, that pee and that poop is a sign that there are these little prey animals there that predators might want to eat. And so that's part of the way that mom protects them is by making sure that that material is not around for predators to sniff. <clears throat> so that's why it works the way it does. And in our world of fostering, the only thing we have to do is just rub their genitals very gently and stimulate them to go to the bathroom. And they go, most of the time, they will urinate pretty much every time. They won't always defecate. It should happen once every 24 hours. For the when they first get home, it's not uncommon for it to take 48 hours before they have their first bowel movement because they've shifted from eating on mama's milk to this formula and their their digestive system is adjusting. So the first time it may it may take a couple days, but normally they should be going every at least once a day. It's best to um, 
make sure that the material that you're using is either nice and soft or um, moist. Um, what I usually use, my kind of my go-to for everything Bottle Baby Kitten is receiving blankets. They're great in the carrier, they're great to put over the snuggle safe, and they're also really nice for eliminating because they're nice and soft and they're inexpensive. So you can buy a couple packs of 10 of them and have lots of them on hand as you go through them as they get dirty. But other things you can use are cotton balls, towels, baby wipes are good. Um, you're just going to be rubbing in a either a circle or back and forth right around their genitals and that will um, stimulate them to eliminate, which Abby will be showing you in a little bit. They should be urinating pretty much every time unless they've eaten very recently. Sometimes they, you might just get a drop or two. Once they hit about three to four weeks, so the age that Abby is now, um, you, you can start transitioning over them, them over to the litter box. Or if you happen to see them going on their own, again, you can start them with the litter box. And uh, a good way to do that is to start that elimination process over the box so that you get a little bit of pee or poop in the box. And then they recognize their smell there and they go back to it more quickly and, um, and learn to go to the bathroom in their litter box. Um, for puppies, of course, they they don't um, they don't do litter training, but you can use well pretty much I think with puppies, um, puppy pee pads are a a saving grace of raising puppies because they're pretty much just gonna go where they are. <laughs> okay, cleaning kittens or puppies, so they can be very messy, and you want to make sure that they're nice and clean because cleanliness. Um, helps them stay nice and healthy as well. Um, but you do want to be careful how much you bathe them. And this also goes back to the fact that they are um, unable to regulate their body temperature. So you don't want to get them cold if you don't have to. So <clears throat> um, normally if you can keep your kitten or puppy clean by either a damp washcloth or a, um, a baby wipe, those sorts of things, just wipe the dirty parts, which are basically going to be the ends. You know, the face might get a little milk on it. And of course, the, the bum is going to have maybe a little pee or poop on there. Um, so the less you can get them wet, the better. Sometimes you do have to go whole hog though and give them a bath. Um, if they have diarrhea, um, a good thing, that, a way that you can minimize the amount that you get them wet is to give them a butt bath and really just get that hind end nice and clean. Um, the other reason why you might need to give them a bath is if they have any fleas on them. Um, flea, flea medication that kills fleas, the, the chemicals are very toxic. And so very small kittens and puppies are too small to have those chemicals applied to them. And so the only way that you can kill fleas on them or the best way you can kill fleas is to give them a bath <clears throat> with dish soap. Um, I like to use fragrance free dish, dish soap because it's nice and mild. And what it does is it actually suffocates the fleas that are on the puppy or the kitten and, um, and kills them in a, a more natural way. Um, and safe way than, than using those chemicals. Sometimes you will have to leave, if the fleas are really bad, leave, the, leave them soaked up for five minutes. And what I do when I have to do that is I pop a towel into the microwave before, microwave, sorry, I actually did do that once, almost set it on fire, that was a long time ago. Pop a towel into the dryer, <laughs> get it nice and warm, and then have that ready so that once I have the kitten all soaked up, I wrap them in the nice warm towels so that they stay as warm as possible during that five minutes while those fleas are being suffocated. Um, yeah, so you, and once you have the bath completely done, you want to make sure to get them as dry as possible. You don't want to put a damp kitten or puppy back into their crate. Um, you can also very, very carefully use a hair dryer, but you want to make sure to keep it on a low setting and keep it at a, um, a at least six inches away from the kitten or puppy because you don't want to um, get that heat too close to their skin. It's very, very delicate and can be injured very early. So, or very easily. So just make sure they're nice and warm. And if you are using a, a dryer, make sure to keep it a safe distance from the kitten or puppy. Weaning. So that is where Miss Abby Kadabby is. She's going to be getting her first solid food in the first in the next day or so. Um, when they're able to lick formula for your finger or they're they're showing interest in other types of food, sometimes if they're sitting near you and they're interested in your food, which certainly has happened to me, um, that's time to get them weaning. So some kittens will go straight to just the canned food, like the like you see here in the picture. <clears throat> um, some kittens do better when you start off mixing KMR um, into their canned food, and you can actually make a um, a sort of a meat flavored slurry and start them bottle feeding on that slurry as well, so that they get used to that meat flavor and it's easier for them to transition from going to the bottle into a dish. They will. Um, 
look a little um, a little silly, but when you first try and get them to eat from a dish, it, sometimes they just, all they do is end up walking through the food and it takes them a few days before they figure out how this eating from a dish thing works, but they do get the hang of it. And um, yeah, some, and just because every kitten and puppy is an individual, I've also had kittens that just went straight to dry food and wanted nothing to do with wet food or with slurry. So whatever gets them over into that solid food eating on their own um, category is fine. You might just need to kind of Experiment a little bit and see what works for your kittens to get them into that lean stage. Um, if they are, and most kittens and puppies will will do best with the slurry intermediate stage, what you want to do over the next few days is slowly reduce the amount of formula in there so that eventually you are going from the watery mix to basically the very last little bit of KMR in their wet food to just their wet food. And by six weeks, ideally, they should be eating at least the canned food. You can also have dry food available for them at this time. Um, once they're weaned, you want to have dry food available all the time so they can eat whenever they're hungry. And then ideally, you want to feed them at least three times a day wet food as well. <clears throat> um, again, they can be, puppies and kittens are individuals. Sometimes they wean much sooner. Sometimes they take longer. I had one kitten who refuse to take a bite of solid food until she was eight weeks old. So occasionally that will happen as well. But most kittens and puppies, once they hit that four week stage, they're they're ready to start weaning. <clears throat> so um, we talked a little bit, a bit about illness before. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Part of that illness prevention is, of course, vaccination. So it's really important to keep them vaccinated and get keep them on their booster schedule. If mom is with them, um, and sometimes you'll be doing bottle feeding for maybe a mom that has too many kittens to feed on her own, and you're doing some supplemental bottle feeding. So you want to make sure mom has uh, is up to date on her, her vaccines as well. But even when everyone is fully vaccinated, um, just in the wild, 30% um, of every litter can still die. That's very normal without any medical intervention and without any medical care. So for these little guys, especially these orphans who are away from their moms, it's really important that you keep a sign, keep an eye out for any signs of illness and make sure to get them addressed right away. So the first person that you would notify if you had any concerns would be your case manager and they will um, get more detail from you on what those signs and symptoms are and give them your give work you through the next steps to take, um, whether that be some supplemental care or um, or um, whether they need to be seen by the HRA medical team right away. They'll they'll help you figure that out. One thing that is really common in kittens, no matter what the source of their illness, is diarrhea, or sorry, dehydration. Um, most of the time that will come from diarrhea, sometimes from vomiting, but it can be really um, it can become critical very quickly because when kittens get dehydrated, their organs can start to shut down and it be can, can become fatal in just a day or two. So that is um, that is really important to keep an eye out for. It's not necessarily the cause of the illness. Again, it's the symptom and um, it can be one that can become more debilitating than the illness itself. So you always want to be thinking about dehydration in the back of your mind. Um, and again, you don't want to give um, any... Um, fluids, whether they be the bottle or um, we'll talk about subcutaneous fluids to a puppy or a kitten who is cold either because they can't regulate their own body temperature. Ouch, Abby. Sorry, she's getting hungry and chewing on my fingers. Okay, so and we'll be getting to Abby very soon for the demonstration part of our of our training here. So critical signs of illness that need to um, where you would need to take action are if they didn't eat at all during their last meal, um, that is something that you want to keep a very, very close eye on. Um, if they have had significant weight loss, especially over a day, more than a day, um, then that is something that you want to talk to your case manager about as well. If they've had liquid diarrhea for more than 48 hours, then they're going to need a medical appointment to figure out the most appropriate care for them. If they're dehydrated, as I mentioned, that is um, that is really a um, a key indicator, um, a key symptom. No matter what the the cause of the illness, that can become extremely debilitating. If they're listless, um, especially if they're to the point where they're really lethargic and they're not even able to lift up their head, um, that can become an emergency. Especially, like I said, if they're lethargic, if they're 
consistently vomiting, that can also be an emergency if they're bleeding, of course, if they have any neurological signs. This can be a little more difficult with smaller kittens where they're still getting their muscle control. Um, but if they are having seizures or falling over or things like that, those can be emergencies as well. Um, likewise, if they're having difficulty going to the bathroom, that can also be an emergency. Things to monitor, so you want to keep a close eye on these. Um, these may just require some supportive care. They may require getting into um, a medical appointment soon. It just depends on, on how things develop. But these are things you do want to notice and keep a close eye on. If they have any sneezing, wheezing, um, any nasal discharge or coughing, uh, ocular discharge. If they have mild lethargy, they're just not as playful as they normally are. That's something you want to keep an eye on. If they didn't gain weight, you want to keep an eye on though. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes kittens will have plateaus where they might go like three days where they stay at the same weight. It's not necessarily an emergency, but it's definitely something that you want to keep a close eye on. If they have loose stool, that can tip over into diarrhea pretty quickly, so you want to keep an eye on that. Occasional vomiting, um, decreased appetite, those also you want to keep a close eye on. Um, limping, that can be not just injuries, but there's a virus called Khaleesi virus where one of the symptoms is joint pain. So um, limping can be more of a problem than you might think and is definitely something you want to keep an eye on. Um, anything that's unusual for that kitten, also you want to keep an eye on that as well. So if... Um, uh, uh, if, if anything, if you have any urgent medical issues, um, you definitely will, the kitten will need to see a DVM. Um, of course, it can be, it can be a little bit challenging to figure out exactly how critical the issue is and how soon the appointment needs to take place. So as I mentioned earlier, we in this pandemic world, our medical, um, our medical system is a little bit different than it used to be. And we have um, our first step for medical care, for DVM care for seeing a vet is actually gonna be a telemedicine appointment rather than an in-person appointment. Um, if meds are, are needed, then the DVM would prescribe those and you would be able to pick those up at the shelter. Um, but work with your case manager to figure out what type of appointment is appropriate if you have any issue that needs um, med the medical team to see the kittens. But if you have any sort of urgent symptoms, any time or day where it's an emergency, um, what you want to do is call the front desk at our New York Avenue location. And that phone number is there. You'll see 202-576-6664. Um, since we are the um, animal control facility for the district, we're at that available at that number uh, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. And um, we don't have medical staff on the premises every day of the year, but if it's outside of business hours and you have a medical emergency, our staff at the front desk there at New York Avenue will be able to contact our medical on-call team and they will um, do some triage and figure out what the next steps are for that particular situation. So I would recommend programming that number into your phone because if you do ever have an emergency, that is definitely, um, that's the one time you can reach, uh, reach the, not necessarily the foster team directly, but reach out about your fosters directly via phone call um, is when you have emergencies. So definitely keep that number in mind. Um, what's next? So again, thank you so much for, um, for attending today. Um, if you are interested in fostering bottle babies, make sure to either sign up on deck or complete your, or um, go back into your on deck um, sign up and update your preferences. We have some flexibility there as far as if you only want to foster bottle babies that are, you might want to start off, for example, with um, babies that are weaning that are in the three to five week stage or um, the one to three week stage. Those are, those are, uh, I hesitate to say easy, easy, but definitely easier than that very first week of life. Granted, that's going to, you know, be a little more intense. The babies are more delicate. You're waking up more often during the night to feed them. So you can enter those preferences in on deck and we'll make sure to match you with kittens that um, that match those preferences. So um, so now I'm going to move on to our demonstration portion, which um, Abby is going to be very happy about. Um, okay, so here, okay, so here is the source of the noise, just so you can see her before we get started. This is little Miss Abby Cadabby. She's about four weeks old. She's, so she's going a good, um, she can go eight hours between meals, but um, even though she's only eaten about two hours ago, she's very hungry and she's happy to give you a demonstration of how to feed these little bottle baby kittens. So, oh, wait, sorry. Just had the, I'm gonna move this down here a little bit so you can see where she is. 
Um, so here's our, our Miracle Nipple, um, which just fell off the bottle, but you can see another great thing about them is they fit onto every type of bottle. They're really easy to get in there. Um, and as you can see here, um, Abby knows her bottle very well. Um, and is very excited to get it. So the way that I do, the way that I hold kittens, I kind of start off by holding one hand around their little shoulders here so I can kind of maneuver them. Um, she's much better than she used to be. She used to be a little nightmare about uh, about feeding on the bottle because she would get overexcited. Um, but this helps kind of give you some, a little bit of control. So um, have my bottle in the other hand. I'm going to kind of tip her head up so that she is good about getting it right into her mouth there. Um, another thing that I'll do for kittens that are flailing, she's so much better now. She used to toss her head around and clamp down on the nipple, but when they are getting really crazy, what I'll do is I will put their little chin on my finger here on the palm of my hand and then wrap my little pinky finger around their head. Um, I'm not squeezing or anything like that. I'm just supporting her head. And that way, if she turns her head back and forth, I can keep her on the bottle because sometimes what they'll do is they'll get so excited that they will pull themselves off the bottle and then they'll get really frustrated and start yelling and get so kind of over anxious that they have trouble staying on the bottle or getting back on the bottle. She's fortunately much better now. That's the kind of thing they might do where they turn their head. They're kind of chewing a little bit. So she's ready for a little bit of a break. Um, so if I had another kitten with her, I would be and are you able to see okay? Yeah, there we yeah. go. Okay. Yeah, we see. Um, if I had another kitten with her, this is where I would switch over to that other kitten. But as you can see, she's ready to go back to her bottle again. So you can see her kind of flailing a little bit with the feet. This is one of the things that you might deal with with kittens. And this is where having something for them to rest their paws on is going to get them um, situated more comfortably. With her, I, I actually went through a period where I had to swaddle her because she was flailing so wildly <clears throat> and turning her head back and forth, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and just generally screaming and fussing all the time. But you can see a little how she's kind of turning her head there a little bit. Um, she's finally figured out how to stay on the bottle, but it took her a long time. She kept, yeah, see now she's gotten herself off the bottle and she yelled, <clears throat> um, getting herself off the bottle again, but she wants back on and now she's kind of scrabbling a little bit. And I don't know if you can see, but she actually has it like clamped in her mouth on the side, even though she can't actually eat this way. So that's where this little hold around the shoulders can be handy. Um, so I can just get that nipple right in there and get her settled and get her eating again. My little wild child. And she's not doing, unfortunately, one of the cutest things. When kittens, um, there's more scrabbling for you. She's such a crazy. Um, so this, these are some of the challenging behaviors that you might see um, that might require a little manipulation to get them settled down <laughs> so that they can keep eating. Um, ah, oh, right. But the one thing she's not showing you is sometimes one of the cutest things kittens will do <clears throat> when they're nursing really intently their ears will actually twitch in time with their suckles on the bottle and it's really adorable. Um, yeah, so unfortunately she won't show us that part, but she is going to show us how we do the pottying. So I'm just going to use a, um, a, a nice little receiving blanket here and I'm just going to rub her little genitals. She just pooped while well, we just started this, so she probably won't have any of that, but um, yeah, I don't know if you can see there a little bit, but she is doing a little bit of peeing. She had peed a couple hours ago too, so she might not have to go too much. And sometimes they really will fuss at you when you're when you're potting them um, because they it's just kind of annoying and they want to get back to the bottle. So don't be surprised if they're annoyed, but um, it won't last and you'll all get through it together. Um, sometimes the kittens are really fussy when they first get on the bottle. Another thing you can do is potty them before you start feeding them because they might have to go to the bathroom really bad and they might be really agitated about that and that might be preventing them from latching on and, and sticking with their, their meal. Crazy kitten. So yes, yeah, so she is just about done. Sarah, how do you know when they're done? They will, um, so they, they will start pulling off on their own. Um, I pretty much if they are if they are telling me that they're done if they're turning their head away walking away I will not push any more on them um, yeah. as long as they're gaining weight steadily. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> She's just so nuts. As long as they're gaining weight steadily, I'm um, not going to be too worried about how much that they're eating in the individual meal. She's just being so helpful, showing you all of the challenging behaviors that kids <laughs> can do when they're <laughs> when they're really anxious about their model. And she, I'm trying to pull it out so I can re rejigger it so it's actually going into her mouth and she's holding on with her teeth. Okay, I know. So I'm gonna do my little swaddle here just so you can see it since she's being Miss Abby. So I'm just wrapping it around her enough that um, I can keep her little legs and claws in and that way she won't be scrabbling quite so much. Um, another way to easy way to get the, the nipple in is if you kind of stick it in the side of their mouth. That sometimes if they're not opening their mouth right away will will help you get them latched on. <laughs> She's clamped down on it again. You're not we're not gonna get anywhere, Bibs. <laughs> um, Sarah, are there any common questions that you usually get that we could answer right now? Um I think maybe the, uh, the the one that you asked is probably the biggest. How do you know when they're done? Um, how do you make sure that they get enough in, enough food? Um, really, all goes back to that making sure that they are um, making sure that they are gaining weight um, regularly. I know there are more, and they are escaping me right now. <laughs> um, some of the questions that have come up in past trainings is kind of where do you get snuggle safes? Where do you get those snuggle kitties? You can go right onto Chewy or to Amazon and order them. Um, and like we said, we have those in stock to lend out to you. Um, and we'll get you started with your first can of puppy or kitten milk replacer. And our apologies for a little technical difficulties, but um, we ask for your forgiveness while you're looking at the cuteness of little Abby Cadabby there and her little alien self. Look at her little ears all tipped over still. It's so cute. All right, Sarah, anything else you want to add? I just am really grateful for everyone who took the time out tonight to take this training because um, bottle baby fosters are really our most critical fosters. They're the one population that um, we can't care for in the shelter because we just don't have the ability to feed them and care for them 24 hours a day. So we're just super grateful that you're joining us on this bottle baby journey. Thanks for completing this HRA foster training. If you'd like to receive credit for completion of this training, please email us at foster at humanerescuealliance.org and we'll update your records to indicate that your bottle baby trained. Happy fostering!